Hi everyone. The webinar is scheduled to begin at noon and we're just going to give folks a couple more minutes um, to sign on and log on um, before we begin. So just hold tight. All right, we're just gonna wait a few more minutes as folks are still signing on before we begin. All right, so I think we'll get started now because we have a lot to cover today. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being on this webinar. My name is Molly Colton. I'm an organizer with Sierra Club California. And today we're going to talk about the importance of the San Francisco Bay Delta and the threat it faces, primarily from the proposed single tunnel project. Brandon Dawson, who is our lead policy advocate on water issues, will be giving a detailed presentation on the Delta ecosystem as well as information on the proposed Delta conveyance project and what you can do to help protect this important resource. We want to make sure that this is more of a conversation rather than a lecture. So every couple slides, we'll take a break and pause for questions um, or comments. If you have a question, feel free to use the raise hand feature in the panel um, and I can unmute you and you can ask your question or you can just type your question into the chat box and we'll get to it um, during our break. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Brandon. All right. Hi, uh, everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brandon Dawson and I'm the water policy advocate for Sierra Club California. Um, so just a bit of an overview. First, we'll talk about the uh, Sacramento San Joaquin River Delta where it is, who and what lives there, and then we'll talk about some issues that are affecting the Delta, and then we'll go to an immediate threat to the Delta as well, as well as talking about alternatives to uh, that threat that the state can employ. So um, first, we'll talk about the Bay Delta watershed, and uh, the Bay Delta comprises of two water systems, the San Francisco Bay and the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta. Um, together, the two make up the largest natural estuary on the west coast of both North and South America, and the map on the right shows uh, where the Delta is geographically located in the state, um, while the map on the left kind of shows how the Delta and the Bay are interconnected. Um, and I'll talk about this more in the next slide. So looking at a closer look of the Delta, it's located on the western edge of the Central Valley at the convergence of the San Joaquin and Sacramento River systems. It's about 60 miles east of San Francisco, and then Stockton is the largest uh, city in that area, and it's located directly east of the Delta. Um, so if you're envisioning a map of California, um, just think it's between San Francisco and Stockton. 
Um, it's fed, the Delta is fed by runoff from the northern Sierra, Sierra Nevadas and southern Cascade mountain ranges. And in natural conditions, fresh water from the Delta would flow westward and eventually combine with salt water in the bay portion of the estuary. And that encompasses three major embayments. The mixture begins in the Susan Bay, which then flows through the, uh, the Carquina Strait into the San Pablo Bay, also known as the North Bay. And then that connects to the San Francisco Bay um, in the Southern Bay, and the water would eventually flow out into the ocean. So because it's located at the convergence of two rivers, uh, the Delta is a key migration area for many fish and wildlife species. All Central Valley and Nadromous fish species migrate through the Delta, while other species, including the native Delta smelt located there on your left, uh, are in longfin smelt as well as the Sacramento split tail. They're all year-long Delta residents, so they um, reproduce, uh, live, and spawn in the same um, in the Delta all year. While some while some um, fish species such as the Chinook salmon and then other salmon species uh, migrate through the Delta, um, the area is also a key region for birds migrating along the Pacific Flyway, such as these sandhill cranes. And um, in some years, uh, that number of birds migrating along can get up to as high as a billion birds annually. Um, Fresh water flowing through the estuary keeps the ecosystem thriving. And so the first pulses of runoff from the winter storms that I talked about from the Northern Sierra Nevadas and Southern Cascade mountain ranges, they uh, trigger migratory journeys of either juvenile salmon and other fish species that live in the Delta and the San Francisco Bay to move forward and to begin spawning and eventually live, get out to the um, San Francisco Bay area and through, the, through that, through the specific Pacific Ocean um, where they act as some uh, food production sources for orcas and other um, pre other predators and uh, species in the ocean as well. So now that you know what fish and wildlife species where the Delta is, we're going to talk a little bit about Delta communities and who lives there. So the heart of the entire Bay Delta region is comprised, comprised of mainly five counties, um, and that's shown on the map on your left. And those counties would be Contra Costa County, Sacramento County, San Joaquin County, Solano County, and Yellow County. The entire Bay Delta region has nearly 4 million residents, but 34% of those residents live in low-income areas and areas overburdened with water and air pollution. Uh, within the primary Delta zone, as you can see on the um, left there, uh, that area has a population of about 500,000, and within that community, within that uh, low in low income communities, communities of color make up a significant portion of the residents um, in that area. In 2018, two counties, Sacramento County and San Joaquin County, had poverty rates that exceeded the national poverty rate. And Stockton, which is the largest city uh, near the primary um, delta, is located which and located on the western e uh, eastern edge of it, um, has. A lot of environmental justice concerns. Um, Southwest Stockton uh, is an area rampant with air pollution um, and uh, from just different trucks fly driving along the highways, um, as well as uh, barge pollution as well from the Port of Stockton. And uh, it has recently been designated as an AB 617 community for a community in California that has impacted with low um, air quality. Um, the Delta is also home to uh, legacy communities, and so these communities are areas that provide key services and support functions for surrounding residents and businesses, but they also serve as important visitor waypoints. Um, they offer unique cultural activities, and they lend greater character to the Delta as a place. Um, some of those communities, such as the community of Locke, is uh, pre predominantly um, uh, popu uh, pop populated by um, immigrant communities as well. And there are other communities in the legacy communities um, in the Delta region known as Clarksburg, Hood, Cortland, uh, and Walnut Grove that are also uh, legacy communities and populated, have large numbers of immigrant communities within them. All right, this is our first pause for questions. Um, if you have a question at this time of anything we've covered so far, feel free to raise your hand and I'll unmute you so you can speak into the mic or type your question into um the chat box okay i see that we have a question and comment from tanya tanya she is the assistant kmud news director what is the spelling and full name of whom is speaking right now tanya um and and everyone else on the webinar i should note that we will be following up um 
with additional resources and materials. And so you will be able to get, um, you know, our names and full information in that follow up email. But um, the question is, how would state water projects affect the Bay Delta ecosystem? That's a perfect question, actually. And um, we're going to go to that next, um, the next slide. So hold on to that thought. Awesome. Um, are there any other questions at this time? Um, use the chat box feature or the raise hand feature and I can unmute you. Otherwise, we'll continue on with the presentation. Okay, seeing none, let's go on. So um, I promise you I did not plant that question, but um, it is a wonderful question that leads into the next portion of this, which is talking about a history of Delta pumping. So the Delta is at the Central Valley's lowest elevation point and makes the Delta and its upstream watersheds one of the easiest places to export water from Northern California to the Southern California and Central Valley as well. Um, it's the, the Delta is the home of uh, the California's elaborate water management and delivery systems due to the operation of two massive systems known as the Federal Central Valley Project and California State Water Project. Um, if you look at its map, uh, the Central Valley Project, or the CVP as we call it sometimes, is in the red. And then the State Project um, is in the blue, and that's also known as the SWP. Um, in an average year, the two systems pump nearly 5 million acre feet of water, fresh water, from the Delta alone. And in the highest years, that number can be up to 6.5 million acre feet and 7 million acre feet. For reference of how much water that is exactly, one acre foot of water is enough to cover a football field of a football field one foot deep of water. Uh, this is also enough water to meet the needs of two families of four for one year. Um, and just to compare how um, the needs of uh, California residents and their water supply uses are um, kind of compared to some industry, um, while one acre foot is uh, able to meet the needs of two families of four for a year. In an average year, agriculture, the agriculture industry uses roughly 34 million acre feet of water to irrigate their crops. So let's do a little bit of comparison between the two systems. Uh, the first is the Central Valley Project, or is the SV, uh, CVP as we call it sometimes. Uh, the Bureau, US Bureau of Reclamation began operation of that project and exporting water from the Delta in 1951. Um, it's federally owned and operated and um, in a year, normal year, it stores about 10 million acre feet of water and delivers 7 million acre feet of that water. Of that 7 million acre feet that it delivers, 5 million of which, so more than 70% of the total deliveries are um, shipped to the agriculture industry. Uh, it's important to note that this system is subsidized by US taxpayers, so its water is sold cheaply to those farmers that get it. It spans around 400 miles from Lake Shasta to Bakersfield and encompasses 20 dams, reservoirs, and canals um, although it has a storage capacity of 11 million acre feet, they usually only store um, around 10 million acre feet. Now, the State Water Project, or SWP, is, it's, is the largest state finance and water project ever built, um, and it began operations by the Department of Water Resources, California's water agencies, in 1972. Um, it delivers nearly 4.2 million acre feet of water per year, and 70% of that water goes to urban uses, while 30% of that water goes to agricultural uses. In total, um, about all of California's water supply uses, 80% um, of all the water shipped, so both from the Central Valley Project and State Water Project, as well as local sources, um, goes to the agriculture industry. And about 65% of that 80% of water is exported from the Delta um, through either the Central Valley Project or the State Water Project, as I stated. So the pumping from the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project has great effects on the Delta sustainability and ecosystem. Um, the chart on the left is a slide uh, on the left on this slide is a great illustration of this. Um, it shows the amount of unimpaired flow, which is the amount of runoff that would have occurred had water remained unaltered in rivers and streams instead of stored, imported, I mean exported or diverted um, to different areas of the state, compared to the actual amount of water that made it through the Delta and out through the Bay. Um, the difference in colors notes the year types with blue years being wet years, so overly abundant years in terms of the amount of water that was uh, in runoff that flowed through the Delta or came through at the beginning. Um, red being critically dry years um, and black being super dry years. So think of those years as um, 
some of the years that we were in the drought um, in California. So it's clear from this chart that the amount of water making it to the delta and eventually out to the bay has been significantly reduced um, over time. Um, and in some years it reaches levels that are equivalent to the amount of water that is only typical in extreme drought conditions, even though, as you can see from the unimpaired flow portion, um, that water was originally available, um, and, but was diverted and shipped out due to uh, pumping operations um, over the years. And as mentioned, fresh water flowing through the Delta keeps the Bay Delta ecosystem thriving. Um, when water doesn't flow through the ecosystem, fish don't um, have any idea when to uh, start reproducing and going through their reproduction patterns. So the chart on the right shows the decline of Central Valley salmon populations from 1985 to 2017. And as exports increased, the salmon population decreased. Um, so the salmon industry is a billion dollar industry here in California and um, sustains populations of salmon up to um, as, high, as far north as uh, Washington. And so um, the Pacific Coast uh, salmon industry was heavily impacted by pumping operations during this time um, from both the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. And another um, effect that pumping has on um, the Delta communities and ecosystem is that a reduction in adequate freshwater flows through the Delta and eventually making it out to the Bay facilitates the growth of harmful and toxic organisms known as harmful algal blooms. The picture on this slide shows the caution sign for one located in the Delta. And uh, these dangerous algal blooms occur when cyanobacteria accumulate and produce toxins that threaten public and environmental health. So the sources of these algal blooms are, uh, they range from fertilizers on farmland to pet waste on city streets. And nutrients in these algal blooms, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, are swept up by rainwater and eventually make their way into freshwater ecosystems, um, where they facilitate and stoke the growth of the cyanobacteria that I uh, mentioned that these blooms uh, are. Uh, with rising carbon dioxide levels and temperatures, and then also periods of intense effects brought on by climate change, um, such as stagnant warm water, uh, they increase the likelihood of uh, the cyanobacteria um, kind of just being able to be stoked and proliferate. And um, it, they really create perfect conditions for um, the bacteria to thrive. Um, once again, that a lot of that being from stagnant warm water. So their impacts um, can be severe. Uh, fish can die off at favoring fishing spots in the Delta. Um, people walking their dogs who then drink water from contaminated lakes can um, find that their pets have been poisoned by drinking from those water sources. And also children can, um, in homeless populations uh, that use that water for either their own sanitary uses or children just um, swimming in areas of, in the Delta for recreation can sustain blisters and other um, public health um, issues on their bodies uh, by swimming in these areas where these harmful algal blooms are present. So um, freshwater pumping, uh, freshwater, the lack of freshwater flowing through the Delta uh, really has in recent years caused a lot of these algal blooms to be present um, within the Delta region. All right, and now we'll take another break for questions. Um, once again, feel free to use the raise hand feature or type your questions into the chat box. Um, looks like we have a comment from David. 50% is unimpaired flow, 40% is ag, and 10% is urban. Did you um, have a yeah, response to that, Brandon? Uh, I think that that's what a lot of, I, I, I'm not sure if he's referencing the flow from the CVP or from the state yeah. water project. Um, so I would be happy to talk to him about that offline, but uh, the, I think that while some of that is mandated, um, by mandated, I put that in quotation marks because that's not always what actually ends up flowing through the ecosystem and through the Delta. Um, that is not necessarily the case given uh, that those numbers of unimpaired flow aren't necessarily the case that's actually happening given uh, recent changes in either pumping operations, so the State Water Project uh, long-term operations, or uh, federal operations such as uh, the biops that the federal administration just came out with. So um, I'm not sure that 50% of water that's been, that's available at the beginning of the cycle actually makes it through to the Delta. I mean, through the entire ecosystem throughout, out through the Bay. Um, and again, I'd be happy to talk to him offline about that as well. Okay. Yeah. And David just submitted a follow-up comment. 
the impaired flow is 80% ag, 20% urban, agree it is getting worse. So it sounds like we'll have a follow-up conversation about that. We have another question from Marsha. Are we, the Sierra Club, working to stop or minimize the load of oil-based fertilizers that are contributing to the algal blooms? It's a good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I don't uh, deal with a lot of the oil and gas issues um, in our office. Um, that's another policy advocate. Um, and so I'm not greatly familiar with that and don't want to comment on that in terms of giving you wrong information about how they're contributing to harmful algorithms. I'm not saying that they don't, but um, I don't want to uh, give you any wrong information about it. Um, but in in the sense of where pollution has been contributing, general pollution is from ag, um, but also from either municipal waste or uh, any other industrial wastewater, um, where that's contributing and where oil runoff has been incorporated into that. Uh, yeah, we are doing some th stuff to stop that. And that's really working with a lot of our um, EJ allies and our partners on um, finding out better regulate regulatory uh, frameworks and also permitting um, requirements to facilitate uh, better enforcement um, of, the, of that pollution that's occurring. And so I'd be happy, again, to talk to you offline about specifically oil um, implications in the Delta. Um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not too familiar with it, but I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Yeah, absolutely. And Marsha has a follow-up comment, need to connect fossil fuel and Delta staff and activists. Fertilizers are mostly based on petroleum products. Great comment. Yeah. Good to know, yeah, please. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, we will move on with the presentation. Cool. So now that you know where the Delta is, how it's exploited, and the implications of that exploitation, uh, we'll turn to an immediate issue that's facing the Delta, which is the Delta Conveyance Project. So for decades, uh, Central Valley farmers and water agencies slash wholesalers south of the Delta have pressed for increasingly more water to be diverted from the Delta and sent south via either a large canal or a tunnel. Uh, the first instance of this, what, the first instance of this was the Peripheral Canal, which was first proposed in 1940s. And it was um, eventually backed over time by Governor Jerry Brown during his early terms as governor in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and fortunately, in the 80s, it was um, and specifically 1982, it was resoundingly rejected by voters on a statewide ballot measure. Uh, the state funded canal would have con uh, been constructed to entirely move water from northern California rivers around the Delta and to southern, to southern and central California. Um, in 2013, a similar proposal was released under the name the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, and that was a plan consisting of restoring ecosystem habitat and improving water conveyance. The conveyance portion of this project proposed constructing two massive tunnels to divert Sacramento River water underneath the Delta and then deliver that water to the Central Valley in Southern California, so a lot like the, what the Peripheral Canal had proposed um, in the 40s and throughout time. Um, in 2015, the conveyance portion was renamed California Water Fix. And fortunately, um, due to fierce opposition from both Sierra Club and other conservation groups um, so in Southern California and in the Delta, uh, that was uh, met with uh, much opposition. And uh, by the time that Jerry Brown left office in his last term, he was only considering building a single tunnel. Um, now, enter Governor Gavin Newsom's single tunnel project. So in his first state of the state address uh, in 2019, Governor Gavin Newsom announced his support for a single tunnel project. And accordingly, the Department of Water Resources withdrew all their proposals for the California water fix and previous iterations uh, in May 2019. Um, the single tunnel project is the Newsom administration's version of the peripheral canal, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, and then California water fix. Um, in January 2020, the Department of Water Resources released a notice of preparation which initiates a, uh, the beginning of preparing an environmental impact report for this Delta Single Tunnel Project. And it's the first state in, uh, it's the first step of many in the environmental review process that's required under the California Environmental Quality Act, also known as CEQA. So according to that notice of preparation um, and also uh, happenings and discussion that are hap um, occurring at the Delta Construction and Design Conveyance Authority, which is a joint powers authority commissioned to oversee the construction and design of the project, 
the tunnel would be a 40 mile tunnel that's uh, 190 feet below the uh, surface uh, in the North Delta. And like its predecessor, it would be operated to uh, divert water, fresh water flows from uh, rivers feeding into the Delta and thus bypassing the Delta altogether. The water would be shipped to large farming operations and water wholesalers south of the Delta, and that tunnel would have a capacity to divert up to 6,000 cubic feet per second of water. Illustrated by the chart on the right, EWR um, and the DCDCA um, has identified two potential corridors for the tunnel, a central corridor and an eastern corridor, both of which have major environmental and public health impacts. Um, the one of, uh, for the central corridor, for example, uh, that corridor would drill through uh, some very um, highly um, important islands in the Delta that house uh, St. Hill cranes, for example, and other uh, bird species uh, as they migrate along the Pacific Flyway. And um, on the Eastern Corridor, that's closer to Stockton and closer to um, Southwest Stockton uh, specifically. Um, and so a lot of the construction impacts, which we'll talk about later, um, will be felt along uh, the Eastern Corridor as well. Um, the project is estimated to cost $11 billion, and that's before inflation and uh, overruns as well. So why is Sierra Club opposed to the Delta and why, I mean, the De uh, why is Sierra Club opposed to the single tunnel and why is uh, the Delta single tunnel project uh, bad? So for many reasons. Uh, first, contrary to what a lot of the state, uh, what the state and a lot of the proponents have to say, uh, it won't provide water reliability or protect against uh, earthquake damage. So one of the main um, arguments pro, uh, for the tunnel is that it provides some sort of reliability against eventual earthquakes that will happen in the Delta that will ruin um, some infrastructure that's already existing. But that's not necessarily the case because even if the tunnel is built and um, operated, reliability would still be uncertain since the single tunnel doesn't address the earthquake vulnerabilities in existing infrastructures. So any water that's exported through the single tunnel would eventually have to flow through that existing um, infrastructure in the Southern San Joaquin Valley and also Southern California Valley, uh, Southern California regions. Um, much of that infrastructure is actually at a greater risk of earthquake damage than um, issues in the Delta levees, for example. Um, and that ranges from reasons uh, from geographic location, meaning they're just they're also over uh, earthquake faults to either uh, negligent maintenance or upkeep. And so some areas have been pumping a lot of groundwater, which has caused subsidence in um, the land there. And that's a lot of the reasons why the water has been um, lost through trans transforming. Um, another reason why the tunnel is bad is because it won't provide any new water for Southern California residents uh, or make their water cheaper. Um, and it will actually increase the cost that they're paying for that water because of uh, who is funding the tunnel. So uh, the project is estimated to cost $11 billion. And like I said, that's before inflation. And a lot of that cost is being picked up by Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which is a water agency that serves 19 million Southern California residents. Um, that cost would, uh, that Metropolitan Water District pays would eventually be pushed down onto ratepayers. So those 19 million residents that receive water from Metropolitan would see higher water bills and property taxes, um, all while having no benefit of seeing any additional water because the tunnel won't provide any new source of water. Um, and due to climate change impacts and federal diversions, which have increased in the years, less and less water is actually flowing from the, through the Delta and the tunnel will just be taking water out of a starving ecosystem, causing more fish and wildlife to go extinct and then also subjecting Delta communities to poor water quality, which leads me to my next point of um, the Delta won't protect against sea level rise impacts and it will actually just exacerbate sea level rise impacts and worsen the water quality for communities and the ecosystem. Uh, contrary to what uh, one of the main uh, arguments that a lot of proponents for the tunnel also say is that it protects against sea level rise impacts, but that's not the case because uh, sea level rise impacts uh, will bring salt water more north into the Delta and what is needed is more fresh water flows that are actually pushing that water out and balancing that water out. So lowering the saline levels, which um, threaten some fish and wildlife species um, and also require more um, expensive and more costly water treatment for communities. So um, the Delta ecosystem and the Delta communities will fill the 
impacts of less fresh water flowing through when the when the tunnel is operated because more salt water will be making its way through uh, through the bay. And lastly, the tunnel won't comply with state law and policy. So um, the Delta Reform Act of 2019 requires that any conveyance projects in the Delta meet a co-equal goals. And those co-equal goals would be um, providing a more water re reliable water supply for Californians, um, and then also protecting, restoring, and enhancing the Delta ecosystem. Additionally, the state act, uh, established a policy of reducing reliance on the Delta. And um, a large structure that takes more water out of the Delta is in no way um, comporting with either rely, um, providing more reliable water supply for Delta residents, so for Californians, and it definitely doesn't protect or restore the Delta ecosystem um, and actually increases reliance on the Delta. And that's just from the, construct, uh, the operation impacts of the tunnel. There are gonna be a lot of construction impacts as well. Um, it will increase threats to the Delta residents and their quality of life, um, evidenced by a lot of the numbers on this slide. Uh, the 16 year construction period for the project will bring increased air quality issues from uh, resulting from increased traffic and construction equipment along Delta roads um, and along uh, with marine vessels that are bringing in more equipment through the Port of Stockton or other areas in the Delta. And then also the storage of dried muck, which is excavated from tunnel uh, construction and eventually sited in the Delta and then hardens and then turns, turns into the clay and then just kind of blows through the wind. So some of the numbers on this slide, um, such as the exact amount of pollutants that will be emitted, have yet to be disclosed by the state, but we're expecting those numbers to be documented upon release of the draft environmental impact report that the state releases. Um, and uh, Stockton and a lot of those legacy communities that I talked about will feel these in impacts very, very much, um, especially around how many truck trips are being um, taken throughout the Delta areas during construction, um, but also, around their economic value as well, since all of this construction will virtually make the Delta unlivable, which make a lot of tourists um, not inclined to visit the Delta in um, the tour season. So uh, there are some measures that the state can do instead of building this massive project that will also meet the goals of the project. Um, which would be to provide water reliability and combat against climate change impacts such as sea level rise. Um, and all of those kind of boil down to regional solutions that promote uh, projects that reduce reliance on the Delta and are environmentally efficient um, and beneficial. So um, these are in line with the Delta Reform Act's policy of reducing reliance on the Delta. And on this slide, you'll see a myriad of examples that Sierra Club has proposed over the years. Uh, sorry, there's a lot of noise in the background. My uh, apartment complex is doing some uh, landscaping currently, uh, so I apologize. Um, I'll take a few moments to just kind of run through a couple of these. Uh, and so for the first one, it would be investment in groundwater recharge and conservation projects that remediate contaminated aquifers in regional areas. So a lot of California's water supply is located underground and those water supply um, aquifers can be contaminated for a number of reasons re ranging from uh, nitrate and salt pollution through uh, or lead pollution or chrome 6 pollution. Um, so what the state could do is actually promote projects that allow more fresh water to be flushed into those aquifers and clean those aquifers, aquifers up and eventually providing a more uh, more supply of water that can be used by Californians. Um, another is uh, investing in water recycling projects that ensure and sustainable drought-proof water supply. Uh, so water recycling offers a significant untapped of water, supply, of water supply, particularly in coastal areas that are facing water shortages or areas that rely on imported water. Um, recycling water has been, uh, con has been studied and um, it's been concluded that it, can be, it could potentially meet nearly one third of California's water supply needs um, if we invest wisely uh, because it creates local drought resistant water supplies and it also reduces any discharges that eventually um, are shipped out to the ocean. And um, another uh, another way of um, another alternative that could be promoted from the state is promoting stormwater capture. So um, stormwater is the largest source of pollution um, in a lot of areas and stormwater capture actually and treatment provides a new water source that reduces the reliance on potable water for landscaping needs. 
um, and also just drinking water supplies as well. So legislation has been made has made it easier and uh, more cost effective to increase wind water capture and um, uh, provide some sort of uh, incentive for cities to uh, promote rainwater capture, but more is needed to be done to fully encourage residents to um, be able to uh, facilitate their own rainwater capture projects on their land. And then lastly, invest, uh, investing in um, uh, water conservation techniques and industrial uses. And so, for example, uh, agriculture. Uh, California could use a lot more water if they uh, invested in the agricultural industry um, using techniques that increase irrigation efficiency, but also employ more water saving practices, um, such as using soil managed soil that doesn't require as much water um, and is more efficiently managed. So um, ultimately, a prioritized a prioritized suite of actions is necessary to meet our water supply goals, and you can find a lot of these explained in detail um, in a white paper that uh, Sierra Club volunteers and um, experts have uh, authored not titled Smart Alternatives to the Tunnel uh, that was published in May 2019, and you can find that on our website. All right, so here's how you can get involved to help protect the de Delta and join us in this campaign. Um, sign up at the following link on our website, sierraclub.org slash California slash volunteer. Let us know that you want to get involved in the campaign. You can also like and follow um, us on social media at Sierra Club California on Facebook and Twitter, where we frequently post actions you can take um, to help the Delta. Also, this presentation will be recorded and posted on our water webpage at www.sierraclub.org slash California slash water. So you can watch it again in case there's anything you missed. All right, and we're gonna take another um, second or the rest of the presentation for questions. Marsha, I see you got your hand up. So I'm going to click on you and unmute you. Actually, I was okay. trying to make sure I was, it was down. I wasn't. <laughs> oh, you, I, I was, you don't. I'm, okay, I'll, <laughs> got it. Okay, um, so if you have a question, you can raise your hand or use the chat box feature. Marsha, your hand's up again. Um, okay, uh, let's see, going to the questions panel. Okay, we have some more comments from David. Oh, these are interesting. So David says, Newsom is more motivated by votes than environmental concerns. Are there any environmental allies with political power in California? I think of the Delta as the lungs of California. That's a great way to put it. Uh, definitely, uh, the Delta does supply a lot of water for Californians. Um, and so um, without water, we obviously can't survive. And so in that sense, it definitely is uh, the lungs of California. Um, environmental allies with political power is a good question. So Sierra Club, um, we have, I would like to think, a lot of political power in terms of uh, what we do with, on the environmental front. Um, Less, less political power, though, than a lot of water agencies and a lot of agri agribusinesses that have a lot more uh, ability to lobby and um, get in front of the necessary people to, um, to promote environmentally beneficial and sustainable uh, projects, uh, especially around water, right? So um, environmentally, that's a good question. Um, and more of a question that's geared toward my boss. I know that we're kind of in the midst of trying to figure out who uh, who donor-wise could potentially be uh, in line with our position on this. Um, and if you have any thoughts, please direct that to my boss, Catherine Phillips. But I can't think of any right off the top of my head. In terms of uh, other organizations, uh, a lot of communities uh, not just in the Delta, but also in Southern California, for example, um, that will feel impacts of the ratepayer uh, that will feel ratepayer impacts of increased costs on their water on their water bills. Um, a lot of those communities are also um, opposed to the tunnel, and so that they're making sure to get local community uh, local opposition ramped up. Uh, and eventually, what we're hoping is when they go to talk to their community members and community leaders, 
then those community members and leaders then relay that information back up to the state level. And so having um, potentially like, for example, some of your mayors in Southern California um, talk to Newsom about this and talk to uh, other decision makers as well is um, something that we're also trying to promote and facilitate. Thanks, Brandon. David um, sent a following clarification comment. Um, he meant politicians, legislators who oh, oppose yeah. the tunnel. Yeah, definitely. Um, sorry about that. There are, um, a, it's, it's so uh, because a lot of, um, um, so essentially it's, it, it, the legislature, the legislature on this is kind of torn in different factions because you have Northern California, you have Southern California, right? And so a lot of the Delta area, a Delta members of the legislature um, oppose the tunnel and they're very, uh, very um, outwardly spoken and explicit in that opposition. But then you have a lot of people in Southern California legislators who um, support the tunnel, for example. Um, and that's primarily because their area is fed by our supplied water from Metropolitan Water District. So um, it's really a campaign to educate a lot of those Southern California uh, legislators and then also um, make sure that the Delta members and Northern California members who do so, um, who are aligned with us on this are also talking to those legislators and talking about the impacts that the tunnel will have um, on their communities in the Delta. Um, but also for low-income communities in Southern California. So um, it's a concerted effort and it's definitely something that we're, we've been working on for years. Awesome, these are great questions and comments. We always enjoy the discussions we have on these webinars. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions or comments to ask at this time? If you don't have any that come off the top of your mind, as a reminder, I will be sending out a follow-up email to you all with. Um, our information as well as some more resources and materials on our Delta campaign. Um, so just give a couple more seconds here if anyone has. Okay, Marsha, Marsha's got a question. Um, who are the biggest beneficiaries of this plan? Uh, by plan, I'm, I'm assuming that means the tunnel. Um, the big, biggest beneficiaries are um, so Ag uh, agribusiness, uh, by that I mean the people who, uh, the water agencies that supply water to ag agriculture are a big beneficiaries because they get more water um, and they get another, an updated, I put updated in quotation marks, way of getting that water. Um, a lot of their, a lot of the arguments for the tunnel is that it provides like modernizing conveyance and whatnot, but it's not really a modern approach when um, you've been trying to do this since 1940s, the 1940s. So um, that's almost what, 80 years of trying to say that you need this engineer, engine, like this engineered pursuit, but whatever. Um, that they're, they're beneficiaries, so agriculture's beneficiaries. Um, Metropolitan Water District obviously is a beneficiary. Um, they get more water as well. Um, I'm trying to think of other people who get more water. Um, anybody in the Central Valley uh, that is, yeah, that's really, that's really the only two I can think of. Uh, beneficiaries are ag the agri agriculture industry and then also large water wholesalers such as Metropolitan Water District. Um, and don't get me wrong, there are the state water contractors, which is a um, association of state water of different water agencies that contract to get water from the state water project, um, which this tunnel would be a part of, um, they would also be a beneficiary. Metropolitan is a, uh, a member of the state water contractors. Um, and so they would benefit obviously. Um, and those are probably the two biggest um, beneficiaries. Um, in terms of the people who are detrimented the most and what's detrimented the most, uh, well, one, fish species and wildlife species in the Delta, uh, those are detriment because less water flowing through means they don't have any um, any type of ecosystem sustainability. Um, and so you'll see a lot of those species dying off. Um, communities in the Delta also are losers in this. Um, they get uh, worsened water quality um, and also less water to some extent. Um, and they also get with construction, a lot of air quality impacts. There's nothing to benefit them. Um, they don't get any of the water that would be flowing through the tunnel. Um, 
they don't get any type of um, mitigation measures that are from the tunnel as well. Um, and then you also have um, another loser in this would be Southern California ratepayers because they're going to be the ones feeling the cost of this. Um, and that's not just Southern California. That's also uh, uh, when I say ratepayers generally, uh, that's also some ratepayers in the South Bay who get water from the Santa Clara Valley Water District, who also is in favor of this tunnel. So um, you have a lot of people who are losers, and you only have two big corporate, really corporate entities that are, um, even though one one of them is technically public. Um, but it's run like a corporation, um, who are beneficiaries. Um, yeah. All right. And then um, Marsha has another interesting question. Um, can we suggest that water intensive agriculture like cotton and alfalfa be converted to agriculture that does not require as much water? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you can suggest that, like people have suggested that. Um, the problem with that, the problem with that, and then also with the argument of like potentially fallowing land, right? Which is, um, if you're not aware, fallowing land is just kind of like putting land into retirement that doesn't um, isn't sustainable land, and so a lot of that land can be found on the western side of the Central Valley where um, it was initially a desert, and somehow people made uh, agriculture be uh, grow, like grow grow there and be. Um, uh, very rampant in that area. Um, that area is not supposed to be essentially like water. Like it should not have anything that requires a lot of water to be uh, grown there because it it is just unsustainable and it's just bad for the environment. Um, and so like uh, those two suggestions of following land and then also having like some sort of like re requirement of when you what you can grow um, have been suggested. The problem with those are um, people get into the question of like well how can the state tell me what I can and can't grow? And I have, I have, um, I have uh, the liberty to do so, to grow whatever I want, basically, and how to run my business and whatnot. Um, and so you get into a lot of these questions of like, right, for a lot of regular regulatory agencies where they don't want to um, basically tell people what to do and how to do it. They just, um, they just tell them how much water they can use. And the problem with that approach, in my view, um, is that. When you tell people how much water they can, what to do, and when you tell people how much water they can use, the way that the state operates things, um, they don't end up telling people that they can. They don't give really a minimum amount of water, um, and so it's or max. Um, yeah, well, opposite. Sorry, they don't give a maximum amount of water. They just somehow the state just keeps allowing for more operations that give less and less water to the ecosystem and through the to the environment, and more water to these industries, and so. Um, you have some good actors on this as your regulatory agencies, but you also have some bad actors on this. Um, and um, it's just an evergreen issue that we are facing as an environmental community of how can we get more regulatory uh, frameworks in place that are sustainable for the ecosystem of the Delta, um, but also still provide enough water for Southern California and for residents that depend on that water. Because we understand that even though we don't like it, um, transferring water and water imports are necessary to some extent. Um, the question is how much water needs to be transferred and imported um, and how is that water transported um, as well. So um, promoting regional solutions really reduces the need for those. Oh, wow, this is great. Um, okay, Tanya, we'll be in touch. Thank you for the feedback. Um, Marsha, if you have any other comments or questions, feel free to follow up with us um, online afterwards in the email. Are there any other questions or comments for the time being? You can use the raise hand feature or the chat box and I can unmute you or read your question. Or if nothing comes to mind now, feel free to send Brandon and I an email, give us a call and we'd be happy to chat with you. Yeah, you can email us um, at our names, and so uh, molly.colton at sierraclub.org or brandon.dawson at sierraclub.org, and also visit our website, sierraclub.org uh, backslash California, uh, if I remember correctly. Sorry. Yeah, sierraclub.org backslash California. Um, our names and contact information is on there, as well as our water page, um, where you can find a lot of this information in the form of fact sheets, uh, frequently asked questions, and also 
uh, different comment letters that we've sent to the state around the Delta uh, conveyance project and other issues affecting the Delta. So visit that. Awesome. Thank you all so much for joining us today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.